Good morning. I'm having a hard time letting go of Nathan's bow, but it is going to get sent out today. Like many of you, you probably watch a channel that goes by the moniker of New Sensei, and that is so, that's such a great channel. The guy knows his business. He's a competition traditional shooter. I, I think it would be called traditional still, you know, difference between primitive traditional. And he has these, these, these videos on annoyances. And I was inspired to do this, aside from playing with Nathan's bow here, because it's funny. You have the primitive side and the traditional side, and there are so many videos out there, including traditional senseis, new senseis videos, about style. And I, I love reading the comments about things um, because there are so many rules for competition shooters but you know we're freestyle whether or not you know it's like the the proper robin hood style draw or drawing to your ear you have to have like a straight elbow or i guess or you have to have certain kind of hold you're not allowed to do this like you'd see like those dudes dragging back really heavy war bows we have the freedom and we should enjoy that freedom and so what I have not showing again Byron Ferguson shooting it's more in in, in the vein of what this video is about um, just showing like different ways of shooting and I've got the target it's relatively close it's like 10 yards away just so I don't have to run back and forth and take a lot of time I will never say that I'm going to teach you technique. It's hard for me. Imagine, like, one day going from a bow like this, the next day shooting a 46-inch horse bow, the next I'll make a 72-inch long bow, I'll make a paddle bow, then the following day, you know, I'm, I'm speeding this up. It takes more than a day for any of these things. And the paddle bow can be drawn well beyond 28 inches, so you can shoot it any way you want. Uh, so, I do not have the luxury of just sitting down and practicing with one bow, one, one bow type, one bow style. I go from shooting one to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other. And that is why you see me with my screwy kind of unorthodox style, where I tend to, not in the hunting situation, because you don't want to flag stuff, you know, I will bring it down and then usually to the right because I always start up and then over to the left and when I get the feeling and again it's all feeling in my case I can't gap shoot I can't sight down the arrow um, I have no idea how I'm even aiming but going from one bow to the next to the next different draw lengths I can draw between 31 inches and like 18 because of the bows I make vary so much and, and so, in my case, it's all by feeling. And that's why you always see my screwy style. A lot of people don't do this, where I start up and then I veer to the right. I almost have to just feel tension on the string, the length of the string, and judge, because my arrows are all pretty similar, elevation and right and left, which I go from a, a paddle bow with a wide handle where the arrow is like, you know, cock this way when I'm shooting it, I'm exaggerating, to a more center shot. And so I've just had to develop like a feeling. Okay, in that last video, the finale on this, this is the finale finale, I, I mentioned that the last three shots were going to be the native style. And, you know, I say a lot of things, boom, I don't have it scripted. When I said poor technique, I didn't mean that at all for the drawing to the chest. I was being sarcastic or satirical, ironic, because what is poor technique? If you were like in a in a, a bow and arrow battle with a native person, an Aboriginal American person, North American person, you know, and you're shooting your Mediterranean style and and they're shooting if I turn the camera you'd see that like they're close together. I can hit both, don't know how, it just works out that way. 
that the proper style is the one that allows you to hit what you're aiming at. Flies in the face of all the, the people that want to be able to hit, you know, a small target at 60 yards, but we're not in that business. I would never, I would never draw down at a deer at, you know, a distance like that because it takes time for the arrow to move through the air and they might be eating or looking at you and by the time, between the time you loose the arrow when it hits, they could have just moved eight inches. And that's the difference between the back of the lung and getting into like the liver. And that's not a good deal. And so, let me run down, yeah. Now to add to the knowledge base of the universe, you have just received your ball. You shoot at 27.43 inches. And I, I've heard people break it down into that. And the difference between 27.43 and 26 is just bending your elbow a little bit. You're used to a 28 inch draw and you've been beguiled into buying a short draw ball. It's like, how can I possibly I love this ball so much. I don't want to give it up, Nathan. It happens sometimes. How do you go from a... And this could definitely benefit from furry string silencers. You can hear that, you know, or else a little padding right there where it hits the recurve. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing, because if you have a bow and the string doesn't twang, it means that it's kind of, you know, um, wimpy at the end. This one is a good bow. This one is a good bow, so it is going to have the twang factor. So I did a 28 inch draw. I'm going to exaggerate. I'm going to exaggerate. An anchored shot with, I'm going to assume a 24 inch draw. Hit the target. Um, and you can see all I did was bend my elbow a little bit. A little story. I can draw more than 50 pounds. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying. When I was lured, when I was lured into buying a compound bow, I went from primitive to compound. I worked for a guy that was a tech head. What can I say? And so we went to the Jay's Sporting Goods, looked through all the compound bows. I picked one out. He, he picked out a 70 pound bow, one that could be dialed to 70, I don't know, 60 to 80 pounds, dialed in at 70. I bought a bow that could be dialed in between 50 and 70 pounds, maybe 70 pounds. And so I chose it on the lower end simply because I didn't need 70 pounds because I was a deer hunter. You know, in a 50 pound compound bow, shoot some. Don't use mechanical broadheads with a lower weight, but um, perfectly adequate. Same with these bows. You don't want to, this isn't a competition to see who can draw the most. You know, if I had my choice, which I do, <laughs> I've got so many bows piled in the house. And go deer hunting and it was always like which bow do I grab and usually 90% of the time it was one of my just red oak paddle bows 45 50 pounds because I knew them. I would if I had the choice of this 45 pound bow or 55 pound which is my 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 sweet range you know anything else I might grab a paddle bow but this bow would certainly be in the running because it seems the arrows seem to go um, where I want them to go. In every case, I'm hitting the target. Back to the draw length. You can go, you know, 28 inches. I'm gonna bend my elbow a little bit. Look at that, that's almost nothing. And that's a draw. I'm using my thumb as a cheater. Or with this bow, which seems to be a magic bow, you know, it happens. You know, I'm hitting the target by just doing this. So. In conclusion, either practice the same way all the time or have fun at the haystack practicing it in all sorts of different styles. One last shot. And I'll tell you an interesting story. Actually, Oh, a little below the target. There we go. This, this is so fun. 
now it's personal time. It, it's funny. I live where I work. I'm literally at all times surrounded by my work. And so I have these things I call thorns with nightmares, where I'll, I'll dream, you know, about something like suddenly there's a whole bunch of people climbing over the gates and I can't get them out. Or like 20 cars show up and they're just packed full of dogs off their leashes and they just let them roam in the woods. Get a lot of that. Two nights ago, I had probably the greatest Thornswift nightmare I have ever had because it contained elements of everything. I had seven employees that were little kids that were getting paid $15 an hour, and that would drive me way over budget, you know, unless I just let them work for a couple months and then, then let them go and then I continue that. So I had seven little kids. I had three of the kids doing archery in the rain and they left their bows in the pouring rain when they were done using them. Element number two, I'm not going to count because I'll get confused. The third element, one of the kids had bamboo arrows but they weren't just bamboo arrows, they were like thick, like noodles. And I was trying my best to put the stone points back on them but the tips of the arrows were like this wide and they were just noodly. Number three. <laughs> I had the cash box and I had to, you know, do the, the accounting at the end. I opened the cash box and when I tried to pull out the money, it was all wrapped in masking tape. So I couldn't get the money off the masking tape without ripping it. What are we up to, four? It was dark. Night fell. The kids wouldn't leave and I'm thinking, I've got to fire a lot of them just so I stay in budget because it's been raining and it was they were unable to really do outdoor work because they were not into rain. And, and so I had that aspect and they wouldn't leave. As soon as they left, I was gonna close the gates because I wanted to go to town to buy food because I haven't been able to buy food because I was stuck here, you know, with these babysitting. My car pulls in. Now we're getting interesting. And the woman, we're, we're a cooperative, cooperative effort between two organizations. Stuck a sticker from the other organization and says, I'm from such and such. You can't tell us to leave because we know, we, know, we know the director. I hear that a lot. You can let me in off season or out of hours because I'm friends with such and such. As I'm telling her, doesn't matter. The rules are the rules. The passengers, a whole bunch of them, it's like a clown car, get out and start running down the trails. So I had to catch them. That's another element. The scariest part of that element, that group, that car, was the woman was wearing Daisy Dukes and an Ellie Mae Clampett t-shirt that's tied. She shouldn't have been doing that. That was not a good, that was not a good um, um, style for her, let's just say. And I finally got them out. Okay, cleared. The next element, was this person popped out of the house that I had dated for a while. Ugh, never want to never want to see her again. That's another story. Um, and she was my wife. <laughs> wearing a plaid wearing a, a really cheesy plaid suit. That could go either way, you know, I'm not scared of plaid suits, but it not good. <laughs> Big old bright tie and said she was going to take the car, which means I couldn't go to town. And the icing on the cake that, that freaked me out so much I woke up was that she was going to a Styx concert and they were going to play Mr. Roboto. Jefferson Starship, you know what there, we built this city sticks with Mr. Roboto. That was enough. I was shocked awake. I'm rattled. I'm tired. I'm freaked out. And, and so that is when I made my viola video. Tell, I'm telling you, I was not fresh at all. With that, if anybody actually made it through this entire video, I give you credit you should get a badge for being a loyal viewer because that takes loyalty. 
with that, I hope this day finds you in great spirits and good health, and I hope that you don't have nightmares about your place of living slash work. I appreciate it.